So the main goal for today, what we're really focusing on today, is some tools for debugging as well as creating a thing called an error track. Um, but I'd like to kind of cover some other stuff along the way. There's a little bit more that I'd like to cover about arrays. And then uh, to get started, the topic is the main topic for Wednesday, uh, user forms. So we've got a lot to cover. So basically, this is just some data that's, uh, you know, products that are offered like at an online um, sporting goods store. So there's, you know, like bows and arrows and guns and ammunition and decoys and clothing and camping stuff. Uh, and that's what we've got here. So, um, so first, why don't, there's, there's several things we're going to cover today. Why don't we start looking at the idea of a user form, and we'll cover these other things in the context of this. So far, every time we've gone to add code to a project, so it's been in a module. We'd say insert module. Now, we're going to insert something new. It's a thing called a user form. The user form has a module built into it where we'll write our code, but it also has other stuff that comes along. It has a graphical interface that we can connect and do stuff with. So ultimately, what I would like to do, uh, we can go ahead and add that user form if you want, so insert user form. What I would like to do is I would like to have a way to be able to edit the data for a single product. So what I have here, my, my product sheet, I've got a whole list of products. And you know, this might not be a bad way if I'm if I'm looking through, trying to find something about a name across product, I'm kind of scanning it here. I can scroll pretty quickly, that's nice. But what's the problem if I just try to edit a bunch of information about one product? What's the problem with this interface? Well, every row except one is irrelevant to my task. And so I'm taking the vast majority of my screen and I'm saying, you know, you don't need that. You're going to be focusing just on this row and you can't even see it all. You'll have to scroll back and forth to get to the data that you want. And so what I'd like to do, and it's one of the main things that we use user forms for, is to say, I would like to bring this data, all this data, into kind of a new screen, a screen that all designed from scratch. And that's what we'll do with the user form. And so here I've created a user form. I just said insert user form in my VBA editor. And now I've got a, a blank form. Make it a little bit bigger, it has to be a whole lot bigger. I want to make sure that we all have this user form started here because if you don't have this yet, you don't, you'll never catch up. So, is anyone having trouble getting the user form to show? We're okay. Uh, yeah, to actually show the toolbox, if your toolbox isn't showing it, it usually shows by default. But if not, there's a little tool here that looks vaguely communist. It's got a hammer. And a wrench is crossed, and that'll bring up the tools. I was a little worried to click on it, don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. All right. So it turns out then that this is just another screen, another window that I can manipulate and do all kinds of stuff with. Let's just start by seeing how can we run it during development mode. Just like we can run a sub procedure by clicking on the play, the play button up here, if I'm editing a user form. I click on that play button, it will show that, that form. You see it's a floating window here in front of my Excel workbook. Oh, it doesn't do very much so far. It says user form one top. Uh, it has a box I can close with and then nothing else here. So let's just see how to change. So, so the first thing to realize is that the user form is itself an object. Okay, so objects are going to have two characteristics that all objects have. And what are they? Methods, Methods and will have properties. And so let's take a look at the, at the first property. So let's just think, uh, in fact, to get to the properties, mine aren't even showing, I had to say view properties window, which I think is F4, <laughs> properties window here. And that will bring up another little box here for me to manipulate this. When my properties window is showing, then I can see the properties that I can change. So right now I've got my user form selected. It says user form one. Well, there's two properties that have a value of user form one. One is the name of the form, and one is the caption of the form. Which of those two do you think is what's expressing this user form one up here? Uh, yeah, that's the caption. And so we're going to change that from caption to edit product. Okay. 
The name of the user form is how I'm going to refer to this object through code. And so I, I could leave it as user form one, and then every time I need to refer to the something on the form, I would say user form one dot, and then I can get to the different objects that are built into the form. Uh, and if I only have one form, that's probably not the end of the world. But as soon as I have more than one form, it should be a name still more descriptive. And so here's here's something that's going to be kind of new: is that we're going to be putting <laughs> controls on this form, and it'll be very tempting to give some of those controls the same name. For instance, I might put the product name up here in an editable box. And I might put a label next to it that says this is the product name. And I'll want to name both of those product name. And so I, what I'm going to do is be a little bit more, um, a little bit more structured about how I do this. And every time I put another object onto this form, I'm going to name it with a prefix that's kind of a standard prefix. And I don't know that there's really uh, a globally defined standard, but there's just kind of some three-letter prefixes that we've kind of come to agree on. And again, it's totally arbitrary. It is just an identifier for the object. But for this form, I'm going to start off with the three letters, FRM, and then I'll give it a name. I'll just call it product, FRM product. And so now, that is the name that I'll refer to this by through my code, henceforth and forever. All right. So here's what I'd like to do first. I would like to be able to put for myself a couple of buttons on this form so we can actually do something with them. And so that's what we need this toolbox for. This toolbox is going to let us bring on different things. And so the one we're going to start with right here is this one. It's called the command button. It's like a little A, B in a box. And depending on how wide your toolbox is, it might show up somewhere else. The way we put one of these objects onto the form is we select the tool here from the toolbox, and then we click and drag to draw it the size we want it to be. These visual objects that I put onto a form are called controls. You see it in the name up here in the toolbox, the little tab says controls here. It seems like such a weird thing to call them. They're objects, they're visual objects, but for whatever reason we call them controls. All right, and so I've, I've just made a new object here. And so I'm going to give it a name. This is a command button. I'm going to, there's different kinds of buttons. There's option buttons, toggle buttons, command buttons. And so this one I'm going to prefix CMD, and then I'll just call it OK. CMD OK. And this, like the form, this button has a caption as well. So it comes with a caption. I'm just going to put in OK for that. Wow, that makes the button look kind of big. I'm going to shrink that button down a bit. And maybe I've got the size like I like it and everything. Maybe I'll just copy that one. I'll just control, oops. I'll just control C, control V to get a copy of that one. I'll change the capture on this one to be cancel. And of course, the capture that the name will be CMD cancel. <coughs> and I'll kind of put them down here in the bottom right hand corner of my form. So now, at this point, I can play the form again, and I'll have a couple of buttons on it. And it'll be a little bit distressing, because I know what an OK and Cancel button is supposed to do. But these don't do anything. Why don't they do anything? I haven't told them what to do yet. I mean, these are just great old buttons. VBA has no idea what I want to do with them. You might think that if it was smart, I could look at the label and figure it out. But it doesn't. So we've got to add the code. OK. We're, we're this far OK? So what I've done is I've changed two properties of the form. I've changed two properties of the form, the name and the caption. I've added two buttons and I've changed the same two properties for both of those buttons, name and caption. That's all I've done. Well, let's go ahead and get the, let's get the OK button to do something. So I'm going to double, so the way I'm going to get to the code behind this button. The code that executes when the user clicks on this button is really tricky. I'm going to select the button, and then I'm going to double click it. And that is going to open up a module that is built into the form. Over here it says form product. This is the module I'm working on. 
this is the module that's built into the form. Every form has exactly one module that's a part of it. Any code I, that I write in this form goes in this module. So I get a sub procedure, start sub, start the sub, end to the end sub, and it's built up of a combination of the object name and a new idea that we haven't talked about yet, a thing called an event. Virtually every object has properties and methods. Some objects have effects. An event, let's just kind of review these three basic constructs in object-oriented programming. Number one, property is just some characteristic of the object. Object is a thing. So property is a description of the thing. Method is what? It's something the thing knows how to do. An event is something the object can respond to. It's something that occurs somewhere in the program, and, and, and the object goes, oh, wait a minute, I, when that happens, this wants to do something. And so objects receive events. Events happen to objects. What, what do you think the event is that's going to trigger this code that we're about to write right here? Yeah, it's a click. But it's not just the fact that a click happens. It's that a click happens to that object. If I was to run this, and click here, it's not triggering that event. If I click here, it's not triggering that event. It's when I click here that it will trigger that event. It's the combination of an object and the event. There's a potload of events. We'll see some of them today. But for buttons, click is the one that makes a whole lot of sense. And so, let's just go ahead and put some code behind this OK button. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to call a method of the form itself. A couple ways I can do that. Let me show you the, the way that will make sense straight away, and then I'll show you a short. So the name of this object is FRM product. Uh, is it product or product? I don't remember. Product. Yeah, it's only one product at a time. And then I can get a list of the methods and the properties by hitting dot and then just kind of scrolling. Most of these are properties. But there's one here called hi. Here's the way a user form works. When I open up that user form in the normal way, whatever code I had running out in some other module that run, that, that, that launched this user form, it says, all right, code out here in the module, you stop until I'm done doing whatever I'm doing. And there are several things that can happen that can cause this form to close. One of them is that the form can be hidden. And once that form is hidden, whatever code invokes the form will continue to run again. So it's going to pause that code until the form is closed. And so hide will just close that code and get it to get it to continue on. So now, when I in effect when I'm editing the code that's right here on the that's part of the form, if I click play here, it will launch that form. So now if I click cancel, it doesn't do anything, but if I click on OK, then it should hide that form. We've got, we've got this thing doing something. Okay, let's go ahead and put some code onto the, okay, so here folks, so far we've typically worked in one, kind of one space at a time in the editor. Let's go ahead and uh, kind of notice this. So here's one thing, is I can have multiple windows open. So I can close that code window here, or I can say restore so that it's not maximized, and then I can see that I've got several here. I don't want this one open. If I hit stop here, I should be able to get my form back up in design. I can have both of these open at the same time. It's a little bit confusing. As soon as I get starting lots of different code windows and form windows involved, it can get a little daunting as to which one I'm, where do I need to go to find my code. But I have found that kind of the easy way is to always come back to the form itself, and then I can double click the cancel button, and that will bring up the code. By the way, these two buttons in my Project Explorer, when I'm on a form, it'll toggle back and forth between the form view of the form and the code view of that form. So there's another way to kind of manipulate which of those I'm looking at. So I'm going to have the cancel button do the same thing. We'll need to get a little more sophisticated here to be able to tell later in life that the user press OK or the user press, press cancel. But at this point, these two buttons are just going to hide the form.
Okay, now I would like you to get a little more familiar with this idea of an event. Every code module we've worked on has had these two drop down boxes up here, and we've never paid attention to them. But now that we're working with forms, they're going to become critical. On the, on the code, on this drop down box on the left, through it, I can choose which of my objects on the form I want to deal with. And so I'll choose the OK, I'll choose the cancel button. And now when I have that selected here, over here on the right, this is all of the events that this object can respond to. There's a pop up. Well, oh, that's not that. So click is the one here. It can respond differently to a double click. I think that's kind of creepy. You run double click in buttons, double click buttons, but you could. And when that button gets double clicked, you can do something different than what a normal click does. Question: How would it, the system recognize that the double click is just too slow single clicks? Question: How does the system ever tell if the double click or two two slow single clicks? I think in Windows you can go and say what the click speed is. That's right. It's exactly the same thing. The question is, does the operating system send in a uh, message double click, or does it send in a single click? Actually, I think in VBA, when you double click on it, it will first trigger the single click, and then it will trigger the double click. Yeah, don't do that. Double clicks, nothing good can happen with double click on a button. You just don't think, oh, I'll double click that button and see what happens. Don't do that. <laughs> <coughs> it was the 90s when they invented this stuff. Who knows? Maybe some people want to double click buttons. We didn't. Are you going to double click the stalling buttons? Uh, double click these. Is that what you said? Yeah, careful with that. Yeah, no, I'm not doing that. Yeah, you have no kidding what would happen. Okay. okay, but there is one that I want to look at. It's a little bit creepy. Mouse move. What do you suppose mouse move does? Not, it's not when it hovers. It's when the mouse moves within the borders of that button. So every time, even one pixel, whatever code's here is going to fire. This is like you know April Fool's Day. Code. We're coming up to Halloween. Use the Halloween code. <laughs> Let's just. I, I want you to. This example kind of seems like a little. It's like a little game, you know, or a little toy example. But it will really drive home the idea of code responding when an event happens to an object, or when an object receives an event. So let's do this. I'm going to change a property of the of the button when this event happens to it. So the name of my button is CMD cancel. And I'm going to change the left property of it. What's the left property? Where it is. How far is it from the left of the screen? I'm going to set that equal to a random number. Somewhere between zero and the, the width of my form. FRM, what's it called? Product. Oh, by the way, because it's really easy to like change the name of a form, and you might want to do that, you might want to like copy this form into some other workbook and give it a different name. The good folks who invented this language said, you know what? We shouldn't have to use the name of the form inside the form that we're on. There should be some shortcut that says, hey, this is just this form, whatever it's called. And that is, instead of having to put the name here, we can say me. Me is just an alias for whatever form I'm working on. I don't care what the name is. It's the form that has the code. Yeah. Is it just forms that can do that? Is it just forms that have an alias like that? Of the things we've learned so far, yes. And I can't think of any others. So me dot, uh, what is it? Like inside width. <laughs> the, however much width is on the inside of that form. Inside width and just width. Question is, what's the difference between inside width and width? And the answer is, however wide this border is. It's not a big deal, you know, these days, because that border is like one pixel wide. Um, but you know, back in the early 2000s, yeah, borders are three or four pixels wide, and that can make a difference. In fact, we could change, we probably change the border. But I'm not sure. So now, what's going to cause that code to execute? Not so well. Yeah. Go ahead. How did you pull up this uh, edit file on the server? Well, how did I run it? Yeah. All I did was, I'm working on this form right here, I clicked play. Gotcha. So now, here's the question. Is the mouse move event happening? No. Yeah, 
It is. What's receiving the mouse move event? The form is receiving the mouse move event. The OK button is receiving the mouse move event. There's no code that responds to it. But when the cancel button receives the mouse move event, it, it changes the left property. Is it possible for me to click on this button? Unless it randomly like goes right where it's mouse. Right, it is. It's it, if if when I move it, you gotta be very slow because it could there that, it happened, but then I moved the mouse a little bit. That mouse, that button could pop right under my mouse. Oh, that was so good. You can tap. <laughs> oh yeah, we can tap to it. It's okay, click to it. We could tap to it and enter. And that would close. <laughs> now, you may notice that this will, sometimes it will move, so it's partially off the screen. Why? I said I only want it to be, that's right, it's because the left of the button is anywhere inside the screen. So if I want the button always to be showing on the screen, what do I have to do? There's no right property, sadly. Yes, the inside width of the form minus the width of my button. CMD cancel dot width. So now it's going to be a random proportion of the width of the screen minus however wide the button is. The button can't go off the screen anymore. That's a little bit, a little bit disturbing. While we're at it, let's go ahead and do the top. Top will be the uh, random of the inside height. Inside height is more important because it does have that border at the top. And minus my button's height. So now it's even funner because it's going to go, no telling where it's going to go. It shouldn't be able to go that high. It's because it's between zero and minus that. Zero. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I just need to make sure this happens. Order of operations says that multiplication is going to happen first. I got to stop my code. Come back to my. And I got to make sure that the subtraction happens before the multiplication on both of these. And we'll do one more thing, then we'll move on to something a little more real. And that is, it's not enough that that button should move around. And eventually, add enough from accounting that you're going to get to that button. I'd like to do one more thing here. That is, every time this happens, cmd.width equals cmd.width. Can you see with this? CMD cancel or minus one. Oh yeah, CMD cancel. <laughs> That's pretty good. I wrote a joke in VBA code and some of you got it. That's great. Yeah, CMD cancel. What is that going to do? Every time this code runs, what does it do? Yeah, that button is going to get smaller, imperceptibly smaller at first because it's only one pixel. And so I run the code, it'll be like, hey, wait a minute, I gotta get that button. I'll get it. The mouse cooperates. Oh, you know what? I just realized I have a touch screen. Let me just not touch it. Oh, you wouldn't touch it. <laughs> <laughs> About this point, someone goes, Is that is that button getting that button's it? oh my gosh, it's getting small, what am I gonna do? And eventually, oh my mouse is not responding so Eventually, it's going to get so small. Finally, something useful. Finally, something useful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe we should do it by two or three pixels at least. Is it gone? No. Oh, no, it's like one pixel wide right here. That's what a button looks like when it's zero pixels wide. <laughs> At zero pixels wide, it can't receive the mouse move event anymore. So, that's it. so the point, and the whole point of that is to drive home this idea that objects can respond to um, all different kinds of events, You're not limited just to the normal ones that you think you might be after. 
Okay, so now let's think about the what events the form itself might respond to. So I'm going to choose my user form from this list. And let's look at this list of, of events. And if there's one that I want to run just right when this user form first comes alive, what do you think that event is? Just look over that list of events and tell me which one you think it is. Initialize. Yeah, initialize. There's an event called initialize. So when the user form receives the initialize event, I can make code execute. And so I'm going to select initialize from here, and this will be code. Kind of bring it up a little bit that executes when the form first gets read into memory. So when this form is you know, it's part of the workbook, it gets saved with the workbook, and when I open the workbook, it's, it's there and it's open with the workbook, but it doesn't get loaded into memory. It's kind of sitting there to script through the workbook. Something happens to make that form open, and then it gets read into memory. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be shown at that time. It can be read into memory, and that's when the initialize happens. Then when it actually becomes the active form, there's another event called activate. And so I can I can have different code happen. Every time it gets hidden and then shown again, it'll get activated, but only the first time it loads from the disk is it going to get initialized. So here's what I'd like to do. I would like to be able to, as I'm as I'm specifying the information for a particular product, we're gonna notice that I gotta specify the department. And if I if I allow the user just to type the department in. That's one of the problems here. If you type the department in, they can type in whatever. We could put some control on that, right? We could put like a data validation in for it. But I'd like to be able to have something similar to that on my user form. And so to do that, I need to have the list of departments defined somewhere. But I would like that list to be dynamic. So that should someone add a new department, I always like to be able to read from the list of data what departments I have and say that's the possible, that's the set of possible choices. And so what we're going to do is we're going to set up some code on the initialize event that says, is there a departments tab? And if there isn't a departments tab, we want to create a departments tab and we want to put a set of departments on there. You know, we don't want all 800 lines here, we just want like four or five. However many there are. Now departments, we'll use, what else do we have to choose from? I'm not sure I like departments. I'm going to add departments all that often. Category, manufacturer, I guess we'll go with departments. Okay, so we'll do that on the initialize. So here we go. So here's the problem. And by the way, I think we've got homework to do tonight that has to do with, with leading a sheet. It will be very similar to this because we've got to determine, in both of these situations, we've got to determine, is there, is, does this worksheet exist? Because if we try to delete a worksheet that doesn't exist, we're going to get an error. If we try to refer to to put data on the worksheet that doesn't exist, we're going to get an error. So this is going to get us into the area of doing what's referred to as an error trap. In debugging, there are three there are three fundamentally different kinds of errors. There are syntax errors, there are logic errors, and there are runtime errors. Syntax error is I, I, you've all done this. I do this regularly, even in class. I'll make an error, and and what I've typed is so bad the interpreter has no idea what I'm talking about. That's syntax error. They're easy to find. If they don't show up in red straight away, so they're trying to run the code, they'll say I can't run this. You got a syntax error. I'm like show me where the error is. That's great. The second kind of error, a logic error, is where the code is compiling, it's doing everything I want it to do, I and mean, it's doing everything I've told it to do. The problem is what? I, I told it to do something different than I thought I told it to do. And so the code's running, but it's producing results that I didn't expect. How many of you had that kind of error in this class? Yeah, that's a common kind of error. It's a little tougher because you've got you to track those down. And that's what we use debugging tools for, which we'll, we'll, we'll review a little bit today as well. The third kind of error is a runtime error. Runtime error is kind of halfway between this. Syntactically, everything's okay. So, you know, if I, if I say I want to refer to a worksheet, I say, you know, worksheets, and then in parentheses it quotes the name of a worksheet. Syntactically, that's fine. It's spelled out here, it's got all the parentheses, it's got the quotes, it's got some word in there. That's, that looks great. But when the code tries to get executed, it fails. Why? The sheet doesn't exist, or something like that. 
So the syntax is okay. The interpreter knows what you're trying to tell it to do and is able to try to do it, but when it tries to do it, it fails. It's called a runtime error. Runtime errors, like the other errors, we like to get rid of to the extent possible, but some runtime errors, either we can't get rid of them or there's too much work to get rid of them. And so instead of getting rid of them, we're going to watch to see if they happen. And if they happen, we'll just handle it. We'll say, hey, if there's an error, we'll give you, a, we'll give you something else to do. So that's the idea behind an error trap. Let's first have the error, and then we'll see how to build the trap. So here's what I'd like to do. I would like to clear off all of the cells from the, the, the sheet called departments. So let's start off by, by binding a variable to that. So let me declare S as a worksheet variable. And we'll set S equal to the worksheet name departments. This code will work beautifully as long as the sheet called departments. If there's not, I'm going to get a subscript out of range error. Like error number nine. So we'll go ahead and run this. Now, this is going to happen when that form initializes. The initialization happens before the form becomes visible. So we won't even see this. We won't even see the form before we get the error. So run the form. And error, runtime error number nine, subscript out of range. Hmm. Some, sometimes when I have runtime error, we get an okay, we got like a, an end or debug. But we can't debug something that's in the initialize. I don't know why that is. It doesn't let us. It doesn't let us debug there. So we got to come back here and we got to figure this out. So here's what I'd like to do. What I'd like to set up and say, listen, this next line of code I'm about to run, I'm not entirely sure it's going to work out so well. And so I'm going to build what's called an error trap. Here's how we do it. At this point, I need to tell. I need to tell the interpreter what to do if there's an error. I have to type this comment. You're welcome to. The interpretary. What to do if there is an error? Here's how I say that. On error. And then I tell it what to do. A couple things I can do. One of the things I can say is say, look, if you have an error, go somewhere else. There's this code may not be working so well for you. There's some code somewhere else that will work just fine. Go do that. Um, and, and the book talks pretty well about setting up that kind of error trap. I have found this other kind of error trap to be a little bit more you know, kind of straightforward to use. Here's what we're going to do. On error, resume next. The statement on error, resume next says if there's an error, just forget it and move on. Apparently, the line of code the programmer wrote wasn't so important anyway. This, the, the nice thing about this, it will absolutely prevent you from, from ever showing a runtime error to your user. Chances of your code, you know, doing what it's supposed to do is really pretty slim. Um, and so, yeah, this isn't just something you, you put at the top of your code and say, "Great, you know, all errors fixed." <laughs> now, what we need to do is we need to to look to see did an error happen. But before we do that, I'm just going to leave this like this. I'm going to run this code now, and it won't fail. It didn't bind that s variable onto the worksheet. The worksheet doesn't exist but it suppressed that error from coming and stopping my code. So the next thing I want to do is that after that, I want to check to see, did an error happen? I will typically write this kind of error code right around a particular block of code that, I'm, that I specifically think is suspect. Are there, are there questions people having trouble? We've got TA. He's over here wondering what to do today. OK. So here's what I'm going to do. And by the way, when I'm coming back to my to my code, I'm just double clicking anywhere on my form to get back to my code when it's kind of fast way. Here's how I ask if there was an error. If there's, there's an object that gets set, it's called ERR. Er. It has several properties. It has a description and it has a number. You can use either one of those to tell if an error happened. Here's the thing. The er object has this number property is zero unless an error has happened that I haven't taken care of. And once an error happens, it changes the number property to tell me what number of the error that it was. 
What error number am I dealing with here? Error number nine. And so I'm going to say this. I'm, I'm anticipating error number nine happening here. So if err dot number equals nine, then I want to do something. If I run this line of code, and I get error number nine, it was a subscript out of range error. I told it to refer to the worksheet's department, and it wasn't there. So I know, now I know that worksheet's just not there. Is there other way I can find out the worksheet's there? Yeah, I can loop through all of my worksheets, and I can check to see if there's a worksheet with that name. Which one's easier? Yes, I don't know. They're, they're both about the same to me, but yes, what if I had like 500 worksheets in this workbook? I have other problems in my life. <laughs> but yeah, this, this could be much faster, you know, depending on what's going on. Okay, so what do I want to do? If, if I, if, so I'm only going to come into this block if this line caused an error. What should I do here? Let's make a worksheet. Let's set s equal to worksheets. So now that will add a new worksheet. It will pass back a reference to the worksheet that was added, and that will get bound onto s. I can then use that object variable s dot name equals departments. And when I ask, when I'm trying to identify a worksheet, the name is not case sensitive, so I don't have to have full case here. But that's fine. Okay. Here's the problem. Well, let's go ahead and run this and see that it, see that it works, and it will actually generate that worksheet. So now I've got the department's worksheet. So it's this here. If I run this again, if I run this code again. No error. It doesn't, it doesn't try to create another worksheet with the name departments because it never gets to this code. Because the second time through when I run that, there is no error. It's able to bind onto that, that worksheet just fine. So here's the trouble. Once I say on error resume next, it's going to on error resume next for the rest of the procedure. Any other error that I have is going to ignore. I don't want that. I'm, in, I'm anticipating this happening right here. And so I need to have some way to say, hey, go back to your normal error handling ways. Here's how I do that. On error. Go to zero. This is the hideous way to say it. That's how you have to say it. This reinstates default error handling. Yeah. Does that make the error number zero? What does that do? It does. It resets the error number back to zero. That's not what the zero means. Okay. What does that zero mean? You want to think so about zero? You don't want to. Th that's actually what it means. But you don't want to think about that. You want to think. Okay, this particular phrase here, on error go to zero, is how I say turn the default error handling. Back in the early days of basic, it was hideous. You had to number your lines. If you wanted to write a line of code, you would put a number on it. 10. You write it with a desk. You put a line of code, 11. And you write it with a desk. You line of code, 12. And you write it with a desk. And then later, if you wanted to go back up somewhere, you could just say, go to 10. And it would go back to that line. But here's the thing. The first legal line number was line number 1. And so when we give an instruction to go to line number 0, it goes, I can't possibly do that. That's not possible. I can't do it. Only thing I can do is what I normally do. I, I have to admit, this is a really weird way to say, turn the default error handler back on. But that's, that's, that's what it means. That's how you say it. I don't find myself apologizing for the VBA language all that often, but this is one. It's a really weird way to do it. So now, from here on, if I have another runtime error, it'll just just play a message box, runtime error 27, give me a description of whatever it is. Okay, questions? Yes? Your mic's not working. We have a TA, just for that. 
Yeah. So if you didn't put that on arrow, go to zero. Um, would the error number also always stay nine throughout the duration? That's right. Error is still nine. Well, until another error happens. Okay, right. So type mismatch is another error. So we could do, let's do something that would give us a type mismatch. S equals, um, what do you think? I think it's going to be a type mismatch because this is a worksheet. Try to set S to that, probably, probably will get a fail. So if I run this code now, I'm going to get a different run. It's not, it's not a type mismatch. Object doesn't support this property or method. So that's number 438. And even if I don't have this, I should be able to say debug.print number before I trigger that other error, and then I'll print it afterwards as well. description. I'll put the error number and the description both times. So now when I run this, um, I, I should still this should still be set to error number nine. I haven't done anything to the error object to reset. It's like a reset property or, or method of the error object. So I can reset it. But this should show me error number nine and then error number four three eight. What is it not in that worksheet Oh yeah, good point. So let me go delete that worksheet. Thank you. Now, let me open up my immediate window. We'll run this. And let's see what it put up. So there's error number nine, set for data range. And then the error object just gets reset with the next error when that happens. So that error object does not keep a history of all the errors that have happened. The idea is when an error happens, you're going to handle it very quickly and then decide what to do. So that's the idea of an error trap. Questions? Okay. Let's do a couple other things now that we know we've got this sheet here. So let's see. If it's error number nine, I think of any other error that might possibly happen. I can't, but let's do this. If, I'm sorry, else if ERR equals zero, then, so it seems a little bit weird here. What I want to say is, listen, I'm anticipating error number nine. If it happens, I want to I want to treat it. Otherwise, if there's no error, if err dot number equals zero, then I'm not even going to put anything here. I'm just going to use that to kind of anticipate when that happens. But if it's anything else, then I probably should know about. Let's take another two message box. Message box error. Critical, maybe critical, and then the message is going to be err dot number concatenated with a colon and a space concatenated with err dot description. So I'm still going to show the error to my user and then end. And now rather than end, we'll just exit seven. So now I'm saying I'm anticipating error number nine. Is that what it is? If it is, great. I want to know what to do. If it's error number zero, that's really no error at all. So I don't have any code here. But if it's anything else besides nine or zero, I wasn't anticipating it. I don't want to just move on in the world. Something happened that I wasn't expecting. So I'll show that message and then I will stop. But the truth is, you could, we're going to learn later in this class how to send an email. You know, through VBA or even a text message. So you could have code that when an error happens, you could have this code that you're going to give to someone else to work with, and when an error happens, you want to know about it. You could have Excel send you an email, a few details about the error that just happened. Um, we're not going to do that today. That's the idea. Okay. Let me go ahead and 
I'm just going to comment out these lines here. Well, let's do this. If the error number is zero, then that means we success there was no error. We successfully bound, bound that S object onto the worksheet, uh, the department's worksheet. So I really want this worksheet to be clean at this point because I'm going to I'm going to read the data off of the off of the product worksheet. And so I'm going to just say this s.cells.clear. So s is the worksheet, cells is the collection of all the cells. Typically we tell it row and column the cell we're talking about. In this case, I just refer to all of the cells and I just want to Clear it. That's just a way to get rid of all the cells. So now I know by the time I, if I've ever reached here, what do I know? I know there is a worksheet named, there is a worksheet named departments. And what else do I know? There's blank. What I'd like to do is I'd like to bring the data from column three, from column C of my products sheet. Over here I've got a product sheet. It's got all my departments right here, column number C. So I'm just going to copy that data over. So hmm, worksheets, it's called products, dot columns, three, dot copy. And I can refer to somewhere else in paste, but copy actually has a destination. The next argument right here is destination. And so I can tell it where I want it to go. S dot columns what? So I copy all of column three from my product sheet over to my to my description, from my department sheet in a column. Run that again. Look at my departments. And I should now have all of that data. Right Trouble is, there's too much of it. What am I going to do? What do I want to do here? I want to do duplicates. We can record ourselves moving duplicates. And you find out what that code is. You know, or we can just type um, s dot columns one dot move duplicates. The only thing I have to supply for move duplicates is I have to give it a set of columns that it actually has the duplicates for. So I could have a whole block of data, and I want to remove every row in that if there's a duplicate in the first column or the first two columns. And so there's only one column here, so I'll just apply a one, and that should remove those duplicates down. <coughs> the default is to assume there's headers in the data, and so it's going to, well, actually, I'm not sure that. Is. The second argument is, does it have headers? And I'm just going to say XL, yes, there are headers. And again, if you recorded yourself delete, removing duplicates, you'd see this code, it would generate this code. So now when I run it, and cancel. See how that works? Wait a second. Remove duplicates. Columns one. Remove duplicates. In column one. XL one. Did that work for anybody? Yeah. If it works for you, I'd be surprised. Um, but why isn't it working for me? Columns one. Did you already have uh, C? Like, did you already have your department C? Did, did you need to delete it? Yeah, it shouldn't matter because by the time I get here, I, by the time I get here, I know I've got a blank sheet named departments. Cell so, one comma one dot entire column. I'm not expecting that to change anything. Oh, I might not have actually stopped my code. Yeah. When you hit OK, what does that do? It hides the code. Uh, if I then show it again, it just like shows it. Does it reinitialize? No. It only reinitializes the first time it comes up. So I can't just say OK to, to hide it. I've got to actually close it. Or when I'm over here, hit stop to stop the code. And then it should trigger that code. There we go. Question here? Oh, no, that was my question. I thought. Ah, 
Yeah, that's what it's supposed to be. Now, ultimately, we're going to use this information here now to do something on the screen. But now we know we've got the small set of our departments here. Questions? So this could go back. This could go back to columns one. I just wasn't sure why that was happening. That should work this way. Let me check it. Check it, and I'll bring it back. Is a question over here? Oh, I think I got it. Zero. Yeah. Yep, remove duplicates. Can you explain again what one in Excel? Yes. Yeah. So remove duplicates is a is a method of any range. You get some random total remove duplicates. Now, depending on you know how the data are structured. I I have to tell it where do the duplicates exist. So, for instance, what I might have is I might have some kind of a customer ID number, and then all, all kinds of data about that customer coming off to the left. And I might be saying, listen, if I've got if there's a duplicate in the customer ID, I want the whole row to go, even if even if I've got a different record in the, and someone's changed like the birth date of the customer. I don't care if the customer ID is a duplicate; it has to go. Or I might say, no, 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 no. I don't want to remove duplicates if the whole row is exactly the same. And so what the first argument is, is it's which columns am I looking at to say, to know if a duplicate has happened. And if it's only, if there's only one column, I just put a number there. If it's multiple columns that has, has a duplicate, I have to build an array and pass the array. But this is the easy one. The second one is the, is the argument that says, are there headers? In this data, and it turns out that if I say s dot columns one, my my editor here is not smart enough to figure out that I'm talking about a range remove duplicates. Could there be a remove duplicates method for some other thing besides a range? Yeah, yeah, we could have every single object could have a remove duplicates method, and so the interpreter, not the interpreter, the editor here isn't smart enough to say. Ugh, I'm not positive that you're talking about remove duplicates for range, so I'm not going to give you any help with it. But if I did something like this, just to, to snoop around, active cell dot remove duplicates. It makes sense to say remove duplicates from the active cell. There's only one cell. But it's a range, and so it's going to go, oh, I know it's a range. There's properties for the range. And now when I say remove duplicates and hit space, it's going to give me some help in there. So if I do it, if I write some code a little more simply, then the editor can give me some help here. So there's the columns, and there's the headers as an XL yes, no, guess problem. OK, questions? Can you just quickly go over that line, the line that's uh, worksheets, products, columns, queries, what that, yeah, that line? Yeah, so what's going on here? So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to copy this column of data. This department's column of data. I want to. That's from my from my data. That's whatever departments I have are listed there in the data. And so I'm trying to copy that and bring it over to my departments tab, my department sheet, so I can put it here and then restrict it just to the unique values that I have. Here. And so that's what this says. It identifies the worksheet that I'm talking about. On that worksheet, the whole collection of columns. I want column number three. That's column C. And when I've identified that range, I want to call the method called copy. It says copy that, copy that whole range, the whole column. Just like remove duplicates has arguments that it can take to tell it how to behave, copy method takes a destination argument, optional. You can tell it your destination and it copies it right there straight away. And so this is just saying on my on my destination, I'm sorry, on my department's worksheet, which I bound to that S variable up here. I'm just going to refer to the first column, and that's the destination for the column. All right. Let me show you a couple other debugging tools. We've already done some with debugging tools, but let me just show you a couple, then we'll move on to do a little bit more with this form. So to me, the primary debugging tool is called the breakpoint. So we've seen how to set breakpoints. You click over here in the margin and set the breakpoint. When I run this code, it will We'll run to there. It has not executed this line yet, but everything else is loaded into memory. When it's loaded into memory, I can go snooping around. 
typically what I've done here is I've just come to the immediate window and I'm going to ask questions. What is s.name? It'll tell me. It's the department's worksheet. There's other things I can do. One, which I think you, some of you have worked with a TA and found this because I've seen you work with this in your code in my office, is you can say I want to view the locals window. And the locals window will give you information that you have, any variables that you have defined, and what information is in those variables. And just you know, keep that updated the whole time that you're working through your code. I don't have very many interesting variables here. Uh, just this worksheet. So let me close this. Things have gone, things have gone bad for me. Let's see what you did. Interface is not responding. I'm turning it back to you. So you S that name up here? Yeah. Same object required. Error 424? Yeah. Yeah, so what it's saying here, when I, when I run this, it's saying, hey, listen, you want to know that the name of S, S has to be an object. Right now it's nothing. In fact, if I ask, probably won't actually say nothing, but it, it's not bound onto an object. Why is it bound onto an object? Because I haven't run that code and stopped it while it's still in the middle of running. So to actually be able to refer to that, you have to play the sub-procedure, run the form, and it'll stop at the breakpoint. At that point, that variable is declared, it's bound onto that object, and you should be able to see that the whole point of break mode is that I can have my code running but suspended. Pause right here. The problem is the code runs so fast. I, I don't have time to tell what's going on. I gotta tell it stops so I can look around. And that's what the breakpoint is. But, but it doesn't work unless you're at the breakpoint. And so you have to run your code to get to that breakpoint. You just hit F5 or click on play. And then you can look and see what that is. Another tool that I want to show you with the locals window is nice because it'll just show you the value of your variables. But you, you might want to know the value of a more complex expression. Like you, want to, you want to be able to see what is the name of S. And so, here's what I'm going to do. I am going to highlight uh, s.name. I'm going to right click and choose add watch. A watch expression just says, listen, there may be some very specific things that I want to keep an eye on while my code's running. But I stop in break mode and, and I snoop around. And that's called a watch expression. It can be more than just a variable. It's so s.name. should give me the name of the property, that, the, s, the, the name of that sheet. I'll say OK. It opens up my watch window, which I don't think I can get to the bar. How am I going to move it? Hmm. Maybe I'm not going to move that. I'm just going to stay right there. So now, when I run this, I get to this breakpoint, and I ask for a watch on s.name, and it tells me that's the value of s.name right now. So I can have any kind of complex expression I want. I can just keep an eye on it. Be really helpful when you're working on big boggle because you can actually have your whole array there. And it will just it'll show you, you can just expand that and it will show you the whole array. It'll show in your locals windows as well. But you can put the, the name of the array in here and that will show here in the watch window. One more thing on watches, and it's more just to expose you to the idea. I don't expect you to use it straight away. And that is, you know, if I right click on anything, uh, S dot name. S.name equals departments. I can right click that and choose add watch. So as a watch value, what is this? What, what type of expression is this? What's the value? What's the data type of this expression? Boolean. This is either true or false. Right? When this thing starts running, it's not, it's not equal to departments. But as soon as it gets bound onto it, it should be equal to departments. The watch expression just says, hey, when I break, I want to look at it. Watch this. I could say, actually, break, go into break mode when this value becomes true. Or I could say, I'm not sure how this is happening in my code, but somehow s.name is equal to departments. And that will say, hey, as soon as that happens, then take me into break mode so I can see what, what caused it. The truth is, I don't get to see the line that caused it. I get to see the next line that's going to execute after the line that caused it, because that line has to execute 
And then we'll take you to break mode, and I'll see the next line getting raised next. So now if I set that as a, as a what's called a conditional breakpoint, and run this code, now it takes me to break mode right here. I don't have a breakpoint here. Why did it take me to break mode? Yeah, the line before it bound the s variable to worksheets, which made this expression true. S that name equals departments. That made that true. And I said, hey, we're supposed to stop when that becomes true. So this can be really handy if you're, you're, you're running through a loop and you know that something's going wrong, but you can't tell why it's going wrong, but you know that condition, as soon as that happens, you want to stop, you can set that kind of a break. And that's the little watch expression. What we're going to cover on the debugging choice questions here. Yeah. So, sorry, what is the value of, of the watch that you did first? Like, what does that do? So, the question is, that this first watch, what's the value of it? And the answer is, it just lets me evaluate an expression. So, when I go into break mode, I mean, it, I'm not sure why I can't move this, um, or why it's up so high I can't get to it. Um, maybe... So... So I'm in break mode right here. I might say, hmm, I wonder what S is bound on to right now. And I can come in my immediate window and I can say, what's S.name? And it'll I can say print it, and it'll tell me the partners. So I might have 12 different things. But when I break, I need to look at 12 different things and find out what's going on right now in my code. I don't have to go and type question mark S.name, question mark, whatever, whatever, whatever. I can set those up as breakpoints. And then when I get into break mode, I'm sorry, I can set them up as watch expressions. And when I get into break mode, then it'll just, it shows them to me. That's all it's doing. It's like doing a debug.print automatically, but keeping it right here in my window. So when I go into break, I can see those values. Oh, okay. The locals window will show me variables without having to set them up. The watch window can show me variables too, but I have to say I want to see this variable, this variable, or this expression. How do you manually set the base control? Well, you manually set a breakpoint. There's a couple ways to do it. If there's an expression that you want to set the breakpoint, you just right click. And choose add watch. I'm sorry. You said add. Uh, I thought you said watch. I thought you. I think you said breakpoint, but I yeah. answered watch expression. Yellow, yellow arrow next to it. Is it just by pressing F8 and stopping where you want to? No. The question is how do you get it to stop? We have a couple of ways that's in it to stop here. The first one is here where I've manually set a breakpoint on that line. I'm just clicking right here in the gray border to the left of the code. And that says, when I'm running this code, right when I get up to that line, don't execute that line. Stop right there. That's the one way to get into break mode. And the other one was, I set a conditional breakpoint as a watch expression. As a watch expression. So I said, hmm, I'm interested to stop whenever the name of, of S is equal to departments. I'll right click that and say, add watch. And I'm saying I want to break when that condition is true. So whatever expression I have up here, it's got to be an expression that's true or false. And so I can say, hey, when that becomes true, break. What if I want to break when the conditions when an expression is false? Just put not in front of it, and then it'll be you break when it's true. You break when it's true. You don't need to break when it's false. You break when it's true. So you can do whatever logic you want. To do. Wow, that's a lot to bite off for today. There's still things we haven't covered that I want to cover. How are your, how are your brains feeling? <laughs> you can tell by the amount of answers. Yeah. <laughs> you, wait, you just asked, I think you might just ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're not going to do anything that new with forms. And this part I'm going to show you. I don't think you'll ever need to do this for my class, but I am going to expect you to understand a little bit about it for the midterm. It's talked about pretty well in the book, but I want to give you to give it some time in class. So sit back and try to absorb this and say, you know, I might need to spend some time with the book on this to prepare for the midterm. So there's one more thing with arrays. So let me just put some code on a new button. That 
should take me to my window. Close them to the windows. And I don't know about I will name this CMD bar array. No, dine array. DY array. Okay, how do we declare an array? Dim um, dice. Let's see if you're doing something in Boggle. Dim dice, and then we'll tell it 24 as a string. That creates 25 variables, puts them in this array, and that's how we refer to it. What if I wanted to let the user choose how big the game was going to be? Let the user tell me, well, I want this to be 6 by 6. Dim game size as integer. Name size equals input box. How big? So this interface needs a little bit of work, but I'm just trying to get to the fact that we've, we've allowed the user to select a value. Now, let's say the user puts in a six for game size. What I'd like to have happen here is I want to make dice six. Uh, six squared. So game size raised to the second power. Uh, game size minus one. Game size squared. No, I think it's game size. Let's see. Game size squared. Yeah, you're right. Actually, we'll do it just like that. Um, now, what's the trouble? What's the trouble? What's the trouble? The trouble is, when I declare a variable, that all happens before the code starts executing. Really, every dim that I have in here, it doesn't matter what the dim is, when I go to run this procedure, the interpreter says, find all the dim statements, allocate the memory, make sure we've got enough memory before we start running, and then start running. So can this dim statement possibly execute after game size gets its value? No. It executes before, even though it's after it in the code. That's a little weird thing. All my dim statements happen before any executable code. That's why, by the way, I can't put a breakpoint on a, on a, on a dim statement. Come up here, I want to put a breakpoint right here. It's going, you can't do that. It's not executable. Why? So I cannot just dim a variable based on that size. Instead, I do it this way. I make it no size. I don't put any numbers inside those parentheses. This creates what's called a dynamic array. This is an array whose size can't change while the code is running. Later on in life, I will tell it, hey, I want to make a different size for this array. And here's how I do it. I redim the array. And then I put the size I want it to be. Change the game size equal to game size. It's like I can't put an expression in there. It's got to be just a, just a value. But it can be a calculated value. Carrot to max. Well, that's the problem. What do you use in track one? Uh, this is zero based array. Game size is an integer. Maybe that's not how you do exponentiation in PDF. Well, I don't do exponentiation very often. There must be a different way to do it. Uh, and I probably could put that expression inside. If I try to put it here, it's still, hmm, it 
it won't run for sure. Constant expression requires. So I can't do that there, but I can regen it later. Good question over here? What does a minus one do? Minus one subtracts the quantity one from some other quantity. I'm like, why, why is this? <laughs> but remember, if I'm, if I'm declaring, uh, if I want 25 slots in my array, I, I, I dim it how big? 24, because they, they start counting to zero. So now, I'm just going to put a breakpoint here and run to there. How big? Six. And so now, if I look at the upper boundary of dice, you should see it as pretty big. So it's 35. So that's what's called a dynamic array. And it's neat because it lets me set up the size of the array after I know something else about what I'm going to have to do. Uh, that's not going to be required for any coding. But I think I may ask you to know what's well, just a dynamic array and a static array. So you'll probably be able to do a study on the chat. Questions? When is the next one? Uh, it's actually scheduled. Is it next week? I think it starts next Wednesday. Yeah, it starts November 1st. In the testing center. All right, folks, thanks for coming. Class dismissed.